Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Dvorak's string quartets, all of them. And there's quite a batch. There's more than the American quartet or the Slavonic quartet, you know, the ones that got nicknames. So those are the ones everybody plays. You know, I always wondered if you wondered, you know, when you listen to the American quartet, it says quartet number 12. If you wondered what happened to the other 11 of them. And then there's 13 and 14 after that. 14 string quartets in total, plus miscellaneous works for string quartet. Either a couple of waltzes for string quartet, there are some miscellaneous movements that fell by the wayside, and there are also the cypresses for string quartets, which are absolutely lovely quartet arrangements of an early song cycle that Dvorak wrote back when he was a budding composer. And they are wonderful, wonderful pieces, the cypresses, and you can play them all at once or, in, or, or individually or in little groups or however you like. There are three major sets of the Dvorak string quartets, which we're going to talk about, but I want to talk about the works themselves first. Dvorak began composing string quartets in 1862, and he ended with the late string quartets toward the turn of the 20th century. So they cover a very, very, very long period of his creative activity, actually longer than the symphonies, and they show every phase of his career. That's one of the things that makes them so interesting. No other group of works shows his development quite as thoroughly as the string quartets do. And, you know, we always talk about how, how interesting it is that music shows this composer's development. I mean, you know, we don't really care, <laughs> you know, about, about his development. No one wants to see his development. You know, it's like watching grass grow. You know, I mean, it's like, you, you, no one listens to music to hear development of that kind, artistic growth, right? When you listen to, to Wagner's, you know, Rienzi and then, and then Tristan and Isolde, you don't say, oh my, let's listen to Wagner's development. No, you want to listen to great music written by a great composer. And Dvorak was a great composer. He was a genius. He was the most versatile and gifted composer in the entire second half of the 19th century. He was great at everything he did in one way or another, in a way that no other composer of his era or before him was great, except for Mozart, possibly. And, and so it really makes sense to just listen to the music to enjoy it. But what is it? When, and there's some really interesting things along the way and beautiful to listen to. The, the first quartet, as I said, was composed in 1862 and is a very, very lovely work. Some say it shows the influence of Schubert. I'm not so sure. Dvorak himself was influenced quite a bit by Mendelssohn and his chamber music. And you can hear that in some of these pieces. But to a remarkable degree, and what matters for us now, is that from the very, very beginning, Dvorak sounded like Dvorak. People carp about how, you know, formally diffuse some of these early works are. And they are. Let's not get ourselves. They're diffuse. What does that mean? It means the good tunes get repeated maybe more often than they need to be. And some of the development sections are fairly non-developing. But when a guy had a melodic gift like Dvorak did, that counts for a lot, you know? I mean, music theorists and music theory generally has never figured out, never, how to define what makes a good tune and what the effect of a good tune is on the structural coherence of a large piece of music, because you always want to hear the good tune. And we like hearing the good tune. And the repetition doesn't matter unless it's really irritating and excessive. So I'm not going to deal with any formal inconsistencies of Dvorak's early works. All that matters is that they have really good tunes. And certainly as a string player himself, he knew how to write for the string quartet. So after the first quartet, there was a group of three quartets that are quite, quite remarkable. The, the second quartet is, is a, an ambitious piece already. But these, these early grouping of three quartets, this early group, shows the influence of Liszt and Wagner in Dvorak's growth. And it does so in a wonderful way because you know what the rules of these things are. So if you're going to if you're going to follow your models or imitate them, do it better than they did. And Dvorak was usually pretty good at that. You know, he was usually able to take a model and say, "See, I can do this just as well as you can, if not better." 
And I think some of that happens in these early quartets. The third quartet is unbelievable. The third quartet, if you play it absolutely complete with repeats and everything else, lasts about 70 minutes. Most performances either cut out all the repeats or make some cuts, you know, to slim it down a little bit. And because nobody knows the piece very well, anyway, you probably won't even, won't even, can't even tell that any of that's going on. But it is the longest string quartet ever written by a major composer by quite a ways. And, and it supposedly reflects the influence of Wagner, which I don't hear particularly well. It's extremely tuneful and extremely long. It is like a Bruckner string quartet. I mean, it's just, it would be, you know, it's, it's just, huge and young and ambitious and effusive and you'll either like it or not but if you like string quartet music by Dvorak there's a big chunk of it right there in quartet number three quartet number four I think is a masterpiece it's one of his great 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 early works and these were all composed in the late 1860s up to about 1870. the fourth quartet which is in E minor has three big movements and it's played without a break consistently it's a it's a unified 30 movement 30 movement 30 minute 30 minute long arch which is extraordinary for its time and extraordinary in Dvorak's output really i mean it's 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 lovely and the central movement which he marked um, on Dante Religioso is is the first version of what later became the Noturno for string orchestra one of those lovely short works by Dvorak that, you know, gets recorded, but often is not, not performed very much. It is lovely, wholly lovely, and like nothing else he ever wrote. I mean, it definitely shows the influence of Wagner. I mean, people say Tristan and Isolde. I think it sounds like almost a sketch for the Siegfried Idyll, except it was composed before the Siegfried Idyll, which is also kind of fascinating when you think about it. Anyway, I'm just gonna play you the opening theme so you'll get a sense of what I mean. It's quite lovely. Here, I'm here. Just, just listen to this. Terrific, isn't it? really, and totally not like the Dvorak we're usually used to. It has its own character, and I, mean, I think it just sounds sort of like the Siegfried Idol meets Rachmaninoff or something like that. It's really kind of amazing. It's an extremely beautiful example of a style that Dvorak eventually abandoned. And in fact, right after the fourth quartet, he begins to turn more towards the exploitation of classical forms and that sort of classicism that overtook him in the 1870s as he also wrote you know the first batch of major symphonies he was submitting them to win the austrian state prize and he wrote the third then the fourth then the fifth and we see you know the dvorakian version of what you might call Brahmsian classicism romantic classicist music um, evolving and this evolution takes place also in the string quartets in the fifth and the sixth. Now the sixth is, uh, it's in A minor, and it was a piece that Dvorak was in the process of revising. It originally was also in a single movement, but then he broke it up into four individual movements, but he never completed the revision process. So the actual work in its final form has had to be reconstructed. But after the sixth, we are effectively in mature Dvorak, starting with the seventh quartet. The eighth is an extremely lovely work, which no one ever performs. And I'm gonna play you a bit of the finale. And as you'll be able to hear, it's already it's already the Dvorak we know and love. There's no question that nobody but Dvorak could have written this music. Listen to this. <laughs> string quartet number eight the finale and so you know there there's it's Dvorak it's Dvorak plain and simple right 
Now with the ninth quartet in D minor, we have, this is the quartet to Vorjak uh, dedicated, dedicated to Brahms. Brahms accepted the dedication while telling Dvorak at the same time to be careful to clean up his voice leading and part writing because he was a little careless, which Dvorak always was and which Brahms never was. But it established the friendship between the two men to a certain degree, or the budding friendship between the two men. And it's 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 an absolutely lovely, lovely work. The 10th quartet is the Slavonic, and it has Dvorak's first dumka. You know, a dumka is is a Ukrainian folk medium in which an elegiac funereal initial strain gives way to a riotously schizophrenic, high-spirited dance, and these things alternate. And the 10th has the nickname the Slavonic, probably because of the dumka, and it's, it's quite beautiful. The 11th quartet, no one ever plays. It's in C major and it's gorgeous. It, it can rightly be described as Dvorak's, you know, homage to Schubert because it was written for Vienna. It does not have those Slavonic elements in it, but the melodies themselves, when you listen to them, I mean, they're recognizably Dvorak, just as, you know, the New World Symphony, which is supposed to have African-American and, and Native American melodies, is recognizably Dvorak, no matter what, and so is the 11th Quartet. It's a big, beefy, exciting, gorgeously written work that was, you know, written for Vienna, and maybe that's one of the reasons it doesn't have all of those Slavonic elements in it. And I'm not, I'm not sure why it's, it's so regularly neglected. Probably because it doesn't have those Slavonic elements in it, you know, or some nickname. But it's a great piece. The twelfth is the American. The American has one of Dvorak's great, great train tunes. And that's the finale. You know, Dvorak wrote it in like three minutes in Spillville, Iowa, when, you know, during his summer vacation. And you can hear the train taking him to Iowa in the finale. You know, it goes cha 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 da 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 da. You know, it's it's wonderful. And I'm not going to play an example because you know it, and you probably have 30 recordings of it in your collection already. And if you don't, you should. It's a great, great, great piece, and it really marks another stage in Dvorak's growth because it involves his exploitation of melody and texture. You know, pentatonic tunes and fascinating textures. You know, the opening is a viola solo. It's got lots of trills and pizzicati and, and it's colorful music. And Czech quartets tend to be, it's kind of interesting. You know, if you think of the Smetna quartets or the Janicek quartets, they, they all exploit interesting string textures and timbres, as well as just the normal quartet kind of, you know, contrapuntal melodic writing that everybody expects in quartets. Even the Kalavoda quartets, which I talked about in another video, those are, you know, they, they have fabulous, fabulous textural elements, and Dvorak exploited that too. But then after the 12th, there were two more quartets, his late quartets that he wrote really towards the end of his life, and he had, when he no longer had anything to prove to anybody, and those, they're like the late Beethoven quartets, although they're all in the traditional four movements, but in the sense that the style is just a sort of purified, musically elevated conception of what, what Dvorak thought music should be. And they are masterpieces. Everybody says, that says so. They're universally acclaimed, although again, not played all that often. And they really deserve to be better known. They're, they're gorgeous works. The Czech quartets all record them. And with that, we come to the end of this very brief little survey of the Dvorak quartets. But now we talk about recordings. There are only three complete sets that we need to worry about. All of them are good. Some of them are more recommendable than others, in my view. The first was this set, which is now on Brilliant Classics from the Stamets Quartet. It was originally on Bayer, I believe, was the label. And the Stamets Quartet did a whole series of all the major Czech quartets. They did Janicek, Martinu, Smetna, and Dvorak, and all of those are in this box, which I have no idea if it's still available or not, or if you can still find it. At last we saw, it was on Brilliant Classics. I find this to be the least appealing of the three sets that we're talking about, if only because the Stamets Quartet has sort of a, I don't know how to describe it, sort of a rough, a rough texture or timbre to their sound, um, a gritty sound that I think, you know, in, in huge doses can start to turn a bit monotonous and they're a little bit heavy handed. So, so I, I, you know, they're not bad. There's nothing bad there, 
but it's not my favorite set of Dvorak quartets. The standard reference version for many, 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 many years was this one with the Prague String Quartet. Now, I saw them. I saw them at Berkeley when I was a graduate student at Stanford, and they came and they did the American Quartet and the last two Dvorak Quartets, along with the Janicek Quartets and the Smetna Quartet. It was quite a tour and in two concerts, and they were wonderful players. And this Deutsche Grammophon Dvorak box has been sort of a classic from day one because it contains all of the quartets in, in very carefully, seriously produced versions. Some have complained that their style shows a certain rhythmic stiffness, which it kind of does. And I kind of noticed this seeing them live because, you know, you look at them and this was, you know, during the heydays of communism and, you know, they look pretty grim. <laughs> you know, you remember you would see these um, artists come from, you know, Eastern Europe and sometimes they didn't look like they were very happy. And they, when they played music, they had this serious scowl on their faces the entire time, you know. And I think there's probably more joy in this music than the Prague Quartet conveys. Um, but they were they were very good. They knew the music and there was no alternative for the longest time. I mean, for decades, that was the set you had to get. And it was the set we learned the Dvorak Quartets from. However, happily, Superfawn rode to the rescue with the complete string quartets played by the Pinocchio Quartet. Now, this is my reference version. This is where the two musical examples that I played you came from. I, I think the Pinocchio Quartet was one of the great quartets in the history of the universe. They had the most gorgeous, gorgeous corporate sound. The, the Czech quartets generally, the Smetna Quartet, and you know even some of the newer ones like the Pavel Haas Quartet. They have, they have a certain, a certain. Uh, beauty of timbre and blend. The Talich Quartet, too, they have it, but never at the expense of rhythmic energy because, you know, so much of Czech music depends on, on vivacious rhythms and keeping the music fresh and lively sounding. And they managed to do it while sounding gorgeous, I mean, just gorgeous all the time. So if you're going to get a single set of Dvorak string quartets, I very, very strongly recommend that you get the Pinocas on Superfun. It's still available. It shouldn't be hard to find. And I know that, you know, I say it's still available, but of course, you know, this is a semi-permanent digital medium. And in the next 10 or 20 years, when people are still watching me, you know, God willing, uh, maybe they'll be disappeared forever, or maybe they'll disappear tomorrow. We don't know in the record industry. So grab your Dvorak string quartets while you can, and do, by by all means, get the Pinocchio Quartet on Superfun. It is a magnificent, magnificent monument to the greatest quartet composer since Beethoven. Plain and simple. There was nobody else after Beethoven who wrote so many string quartets at such a high level of mastery, showing such a variety of content and tone and form. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's really time we sort of recognize Dvorak for what he was in that sense. Such a great composer, a truly great composer by any definition of the term. And he shows it nowhere more graphically than in this magnificent, magnificent series of 14 string quartets, plus other things. So keep on listening, folks, and enjoy your Dvorak string quartets. Take care.